Good morning, and welcome to our live broadcast at First Presbyterian. It is a joy to come into your home today with good news about God who loves you. If you're ever in Uptown Columbus, we invite you to stop by and say hello. We'd love to see you, have you worship with us. We'll make you feel like family. At First Presbyterian, we are family. Learning together, growing together, worshiping together. A reading from the Acts of the Apostles, chapter 11. Let us attend to the wisdom of the Word of God. Now the apostles and the believers who were in Judea heard that the Gentiles had also accepted the Word of God. So when Peter went up to Jerusalem, the circumcised believers criticized him, saying, Why did you go to uncircumcised men and eat with them? Then Peter began to explain it to them step by step, saying, I was in the city of Joppa praying, and in a trance I saw a vision. There was something like a large sheet coming down from heaven, being lowered by its four corners, and it came close to me. Now as I looked at it closely, I saw four-footed animals, beasts of prey, reptiles, and birds of the air. I also heard a voice saying to me, Get up, Peter, kill and eat. But I replied, By no means, Lord, for nothing profane or unclean has ever entered my mouth. But a second time the voice answered from heaven, What God has made clean, you must not call profane. This happened three times. Then everything was pulled up again to heaven. And at that very moment, three men sent to me from Caesarea arrived at the house where we were. The Spirit told me to go with them and not to make a distinction between them and and us. These six brothers also accompanied me, and we entered the man's house. He told us how he had seen the angel standing in his house and saying, Send to Joppa and bring Simon, who is called Peter. He will give you a message by which you and your entire household will be saved. And as he began to speak, the Holy Spirit fell upon them, just as it had upon us at the beginning. And I remembered the word of the Lord, how he had said, John baptized with water, but you will be baptized with the Holy Spirit. If then God gave them the same gift that he gave us when we believed in the Lord Jesus Christ, who was I that I could hinder God? When they heard this, they were silenced. And they praised God, saying, Then God has given even to the Gentiles the repentance that leads to life. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Once again, all who are able are invited to stand for our second lesson. <clears throat> we continue in the 11th chapter of the book of the Acts of the Apostles and continue in our sermon series in this book of the Bible. <clears throat> Let me say to you that uh, what you heard read was a repeat from last week, if you've been following along. Did you notice that that story got repeated? The story of Peter's vision at Joppa and Cornelius being a man of God, calling for Peter and their meeting and the Holy Spirit falling on those in Cornelius's house just as it had the disciples on the day of Pentecost and they were baptized. And so Peter goes and reports what happened to the apostles in Jerusalem because they heard that Gentiles were baptized. Unbelievers, uncircumcised, or outsiders are now being baptized and brought into the community. So it's important that, uh, that we understand this story is repeated because of how important this story is. Also, keep in your mind this last verse that Reverend Souter read. When they heard this, what Peter reported to them. They were silenced, and they praised God, saying, Then God has given even to the Gentiles the repentance that leads to life. 
And picking up with verse 19, now those who were scattered because of the persecution that took place over Stephen traveled as far as Phoenicia, Cyprus, and Antioch, and they spoke the word to no one except Jews. But among them, some men of Cyprus and Cyrene, who on coming to Antioch spoke to the Hellenists also, proclaiming the Lord Jesus. The hand of the Lord was with them, and a great number became believers and turned to the Lord. The news of this came to the ears of the church in Jerusalem, and they sent Barnabas to Antioch. Then he came and saw the grace of God. He rejoiced, and he exhorted them all to remain faithful to the Lord with steadfast devotion. For he was a good man, full of the Holy Spirit and of faith. And a great many people were brought to the Lord. Then Barnabas went to Tarsus to look for Saul. And when he had found him, he brought him to Antioch. So it was that for an entire year they met with the church and taught a great many people. And it was in Antioch that the disciples were first called Christians. At that time, prophets came down from Jerusalem to Antioch. One of them, named Agabus, stood up and predicted by the Spirit that there would be a severe famine over all the world. And this took place during the reign of Claudius. The disciples determined that according to their ability, each would send relief to the believers living in Judea. This they did, sending it to the elders by Barnabas and Saul. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Please be seated. Will you pray with me, please? Sovereign Lord, gracious Father, pray that the words of my mouth and the meditations of all of our hearts, our hearts created by you, held by you, being transformed by you, would be found acceptable in your sight. For Lord, you are a rock upon which we stand, a rock that cannot be moved. You are our Redeemer, our Savior, and our friend. With praise and thanksgiving, with expectation and hope, we lift up this prayer in your name, in your, pra- your name alone, precious and powerful, Jesus the Christ. Amen. Jeff Foxworthy became a national sensation and a household name when he launched his stand-up routine, You Might Be a Redneck If. How many of you remember when Jeff Jeff Foxworthy came to fame with this routine? Foxworthy, a self-proclaimed redneck from Georgia, who speaks with a southern drawl as thick as molasses on a cold December morning, describes notable characteristics that reveal whether a person's true identity is a redneck or not. Let's see who the rednecks among us may be. If you have been on TV five times or more describing what the tornado sounded like, you might be a redneck. If you have cut your grass and found a car, you might be a redneck. If your dad walks you to school because you are both in the same grade, you might be a redneck. If people come to your door regularly asking if you're having a yard sale, you might be a redneck. If you financed a tattoo, you might be a redneck. If you have had your hairdo destroyed by a ceiling fan, you might be a redneck. If you have made change in the offering plate, you might be a redneck or a Presbyterian. (laughs) The truth is, some of us are kind of born rednecks, or we become rednecks, we discover we're rednecks, or some of us even want to be rednecks. Jeff Foxworthy's fame of, 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 of redneckdom created a, a whole cottage industry of ball caps and t-shirts, attire, claiming the wear to be a redneck. Foxworthy helped define redneck 
a name given to a certain group, group of people who behave in a certain way. In much the same way, I propose, a group of disciples, a group of apostles, of converts, a group that bridged the gender divide because there were men and there were women, young and old, a group that, that bridged a cultural divide between Jews and Samaritans, socioeconomic divide between rich and poor, that, divi that, that bridged the divide of the races, black, white, yellow, brown, green, purple, blue. A group of people made up of Jews, Samaritans, Ethiopians, Gentiles, yes, even Gentiles now are incorporated into this community. The outsiders are being brought inside. And they are given a name. In Acts chapter 11, we read that the disciples were first called Christians in Antioch. And Antioch is becoming a new epicenter of the growth of the Christian faith because the disciples were dispersed from Jerusalem during the persecution. And now we read that Antioch is becoming an important center of learning, of teaching, and of sending. And those who knew Jesus, those who are following and proclaiming Jesus, who are aware of and learning of His, his incarnation, the calling upon His life, His teaching, His healing, His upsetting the, the religious center of His day, those who are learning of and understanding His betrayal, His arrest, His trial, His passion, His crucifixion, who know of His death, His burial, and His powerful resurrection, His ascension to be with the Father, His sending of the Holy Spirit, and experiencing the power of the living presence of God manifested in the Holy Spirit. These His followers, ones willing to be imprisoned, willing to give their lives, are now scattered, and they are now given a name. In Acts 11, verse 26, yes, the Christians receive a name. It's believed that many commentators have, have said that it was not a name that this community took on for themselves. I know what we'll call ourselves Christians. No. It's believed that those who witnessed what was happening in the community called them Christians. Christ believers, Christ followers. What does this word Christian, or better yet, Christ, mean? Maybe we need to remind ourselves or educate ourselves. This word Christ can also be translated as Messiah or anointed, or chosen one, promised one. The one who would save the people from their sins. A Savior. And that is what these Christians had found in the life and the death and the resurrection of Jesus of Nazareth. The Christ. Jesus the Christ. You may remember it was in the earlier part of Luke's Gospel, who also wrote Acts. In the first part of his Gospel, he shares with us the account of Jesus asking the disciples, who do people say that I am? Because Jesus wanted his identity known. He wanted it to be clear, am I coming through? And who do people say that I am? Oh, some Elijah, some John the Baptist resurrected from the dead. And then Jesus asked His disciples, but who do you, you, say that I am? And it was Peter, good old Peter, who said, you are the Christ, the Son of the living God. 
After Jesus' resurrection in the Gospel of John, Jesus appeared to his disciples. But Thomas was not there, remember? Thomas, the doubting one. And he said, I will not believe unless I put my hand in his wounds and in his side and I see. I will not believe. And Jesus appeared again to his followers in his resurrected body. And Thomas was there this time. And upon seeing Jesus with his own eyes, he proclaimed and confessed, My Lord and my God. In Thomas's confession, in Peter's confession, we see the fullness of the identity of who Jesus Christ is. Jesus is not only the Son of God, Jesus is God. Jesus said, blessed are you, Thomas, because you have seen and you have believed. And then Jesus went on to say, but blessed are those who have not seen, will not see me, and yet they will believe who I am. That's us. Christians found in Jesus Christ And Scripture reveals to us in Jesus Christ that in Him the fullness of God was pleased to dwell. Scripture also says that in Jesus we see the image of the invisible God. If we have seen Jesus, we have seen God. And Jesus Himself said, I and the Father are one. This was a scandal. When Jesus was alive and present in his body, these things caused upset. And it's just as much a scandal as for those who have experienced Jesus' life, his teaching, his death, his resurrection, and know the power of the Holy Spirit. It is a scandal in their lives and in the world in which they live. A scandal for those who are continuing to carry out his ministry and to be about the work that Jesus called them to do in spreading the good news of this love of God, of God's saving love through a cross and a resurrection. So to take the name of Jesus, or more accurately, maybe to be given the name of Jesus, means that we participate and proclaim God's scandalous specificity in Jesus. The Christian faith is scandalously specific about who Jesus is. And my question for us this morning is have we lost an understanding of the power, the beauty, the challenge and the demand, the hope and the calling to be scandalously specific about who Jesus is? as the Christ. Do we know what it means to be Christian? On the cover of the bulletin, I found this powerful quote by a a very important scholar of today, N.T. Wright. Read that with me as I read it for those who do not have a copy of the bulletin in front of them. N.T. Wright says, where no attention is given to teaching, and to constant lifelong Christian learning, people quickly revert to the worldview or mindset of the surrounding culture. Think any of that's happening today? And end up with their minds shaped by whichever social pressures are most persuasive, with Jesus somewhere around as a pale influence or memory. And what N.T. Wright is pressing on us And pressing on all believers is this constancy of our attention to and willingness to engage and re-engage in an understanding that is growing and deepening about what it means to be faithful and to follow Jesus Christ. So that we not be led astray. So that we not drift away from the God we love. 
Do we know who Jesus is and what it means to be given His name? We need to examine, to study, to seek, to grow in what it means in these challenging and changing times. Particularly for us as Presbyterians in the Reformed tradition, it means that we are Reformed and always reforming, always being called back to the heart of the Gospel because we will stray and we need to be Reformed, and we will stray and we need to be Reformed according to the authority of the Word of God. Reformed and always reforming. We need to do this because many of us may be losing our language in the definition of what it means to be Christian. You've heard this name mentioned from this pulpit several times. Uh, before Reverend Nathan Sauter was called and since, but it's become more meaningful since Joy and Nathan were called to First Church. The name is Kenda Creasy Dean, one of Nathan's professors and a reference for him. And she in an eye-opening and soul-shaking study entitled Almost Christian reveals what young people are believing today. And what is most troubling maybe about the results of her study as part of the National Survey of Youth and Religion is that not only does she reveal what young people are believing today about faith, is that she says they learned it from us. Kenda Dean found that most youth have come to an understanding of faith that has been watered down by culture, something described as moralistic therapeutic deism, or as it has been called, Christianity's misbegotten step cousin. It's kind of in the family, but not really related. Dean writes, in the course of conducting interviews for the National Survey on Youth and Religion, I spent hours talking to young people in malls, bookstores, and neighborhood pizza parlors as they told, as they told me about, well, about almost everything but faith, as it turned out. Remarkably articulate young people stammered and groped for words when the conversation turned to religion, as if no one ever asked them these questions before, or as if we were asking questions in another language. Many said youth, many youth said religion was important, though when pressed, they generally could not say how. Almost all of them thought religion was a good thing, though most could not describe the difference that it made to them personally. And she also commented that rarely in these conversations did she hear the name Jesus. What has been called now moralistic therapeutic deism that, de that describes this faith is as follows. See how it does or doesn't stack up with your own understanding of faith. Number one, moralistic therapeutic deism says that there is a God that exists who created and orders the world and watches over life on earth. Number two, God wants people to be good, nice, and fair to each other as taught in the Bible and by most other world religions. Number three, the central goal of life is to be happy and to feel good about oneself. Number four, God is not involved in my life except when I need God to resolve a problem. Number five, good people go to heaven when they die. Maybe we need Jeff Foxworthy to come up with a new routine to help us discover what it means to be a Christian. You might be a Christian if That's a tall order, and far too large a task for us to fully undertake here. But hopefully it is week after week, day after day, that we are embarking on that kind of a journey 
to constantly call ourselves and train ourselves and surrender ourselves to what it means to be shaped by the Word of God. To be thought that we might be given the name Christian. So I was thinking about this topic this morning. I remembered what has been credited to C.S. Lewis who said, and I paraphrase, there are not really any Christians. We're only trying to be. But if we were to try to put some kind of frame around it, even in these next few moments, I would say that we might understand and might be Christians if we understand that God created all that was seen and unseen and God created it good and created us male and female and said we are very good. But sin marred God's good creation and thereby we are all tainted by that sin, original and our own. And in understanding our sin, we might then say, I know there is a God, a Creator God, and I am not God. We might say, I am not God, and I understand my sin. And I know that I cannot save myself from my sin. And I desperately need the grace of God. And God has given me that grace, revealed that grace, showered we with that grace through the offering of His Son in a perfect death on a cross and a powerful resurrection from the grave. and empowers me to live faithfully by His living presence in my life. But in saying all of this, what we need to understand if we take the name of Christian or if we might be given the name, and it's maybe more accurate to say that we would be given the name Christian because it is not something that we choose for ourselves. Jesus told His disciples, you didn't choose me. I chose you. And when we look at all of the conversion experiences, particularly in the book of Acts, that we have visited from this point to the 11th chapter, every one of them was a conversion that came to that individual. God chose them. God chooses us to change us personally, that it might be revealed publicly, that others might see in the life of the individual chosen by God some change taking place. And being claimed by God does not put us at an endpoint destination. It means that we are people on the way. We're still journeying. We're still growing. We're still learning. And all the while, by God's grace, bearing fruit in our lives. Fruit of repentance, of justice, of love, of mercy. We might be Christians if we understand with grateful hearts what God has done for us and know how unworthy we are. Following Jesus, being chosen by Jesus, means yes, we are accepted just as I am, but the love of God does not leave us just as we are. Will Williman, who has been quoted numerous times in the past few weeks because he wrote a brilliant commentary on the book of Acts, says, whatever the gospel is about, it is about change of mind and life. Change is the key. When Peter recounted his story, his vision, and his encounter with Cornelius, we see the change that occurs in Cornelius' life, but not Cornelius alone, for Peter is converted again as well and changed by that encounter. God is not finished, finished with any of us. The elders in Jerusalem, when they heard Peter's account of what had happened, with Cornelius and those in his house and the, and, and the gift of the Holy Spirit being given to those Gentiles just like Peter and the disciples had received at Pentecost, 
Verse 18 says, when they heard these things, they became silent. Wow. Look at what God is doing. And they glorified God, saying, then God has also granted to the Gentiles repentance to life. To understand the Christian life, we need to understand metanoia, repentance that leads to life. The word in the Greek literally means to change, change one's mind, change one's direction, to have one's life changed by the grace of God. Metanoia means I was this way, and now by God's grace, I am this way. I lived for myself, but now I live for God. I was self-centered, now I am self-sacrificing. It's the process of metanoia to be changed. And to understand there is no resting place on this journey for us. That we, by God's grace and by continual repentance and reforming, are made more and more into the likeness of our Savior, Jesus Christ. And each one of our experiences is very unique and very different. That conversion can be nurtured and subtle over a lifetime, or it can be more dramatic and marked by touchstone events. But it is definite. God's grace, God's choosing us, is not making us better or more nice people. I'm not becoming a better version of Chuck Hasty by God's grace. I am becoming a new creature by God's grace. Yes, even His Son. And the same is true for you, children of God. You're not just becoming better or nicer. You're becoming new creatures, children of God. And we are called to proclaim who we know this God to be in Jesus Christ and in our own lives, in word and in deed. For the one who calls us, calls us his own, a royal priesthood, God's own people, called from darkness into his marvelous light. God will have his way with us when he chooses us. We will be changed. It's what it means to be Christian. Jeff Foxworthy is a redneck. But it might also be said that Jeff Foxworthy is a Christ follower, becoming more like Jesus. Part of Jeff's story is that in 1988, he found his fame and his fortune left him feeling rather hollow and unfulfilled. And God reached out and touched him and chose him. And here's what he says. He says, everything is all about the glory of God. When I was a kid, I didn't think I was good enough to be a Christian. It took me a long time in life to finally get to the point it wasn't about my goodness. Because I'm not good enough to have an intimate relationship with God. Nobody is. But Jesus paid the price of my sin that I might have a relationship like that with the Father. All I want to do, Foxworthy said, is to reflect the beauty of such a loving God, to love Him because He loved me so much in the first place. Sounds like Jeff Foxworthy might be a Christian and know something about amazing grace and a calling on His life. And my prayer is that we too would know more and more that grace and that love and that calling on us to such an unmistakable degree that somebody might even call us Christian in the name of the Father and the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen.